this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net and I'm going to be continuing my beginner chess opening series here and this is part one uh, about the Slav defense. So specifically I'm going to be covering the shallow variation with an early bishop f5 to keep things simple. It's a, a little bit easier to learn than uh, a lot of the more complicated lines in the Slav defense. So just starting out, this is d5. You know, standard stuff, c6, this this indicates the Slav defense. Knight f6, a little bit of development, it's trying to back your pawn up and control the center as well. And I'm going to start off with a game from 2008 with Ernesto Inarkiev playing white against one of my favorite players, Alexei Shirov with the black pieces. And so Shirov, you know, he, he's playing bishop f5 here. He's been known to play the, the shallot variation and what's going on with bishop f5, you know, compared to other lines, a6 is kind of like the chameleon variation, e6, I guess the main lines of the Slav. You can also accept the queen's gambit with, c, you know, taking c4, and some moves with g6. So what the shallow variation is, is bishop f5. You know, just activate the bishop uh, instead of kind of trapping it behind your own wall of pawns. So it makes a lot of sense. Activate the bishop. The trade-off in this line is that this does weaken the b7 pawn pretty early on. So that's you know something to keep in mind. But I, I would go with the activity and the development with bishop f5. So e6, very standard stuff going on in the opening. And you'll encounter this quite a lot. When you bring the bishop out to f5 early in the shallow, the shallow variation here, white is going to be trying to take this opportunity to exploit that and try to pick up the two bishops. This does cost white some time, and I think black gets more than ample compensation. And again, I mean, the bishop otherwise would be on c8, where its future would not be very bright, you know, behind all of its pawns on light squares. So in this game, Anarkiev, he plays a, a pretty, I don't know, I, I wasn't so impressed with white's play here, but it was, you know, I can't blame him. Sure, I've really played uh, quite creatively. So Shirov begins with knight e4, and you might notice, you know, this uh, Slav defense, if you checked out my other beginner opening series, uh, I, I did the stonewall attack for white, and then I also did the French defense as black against e4. And if you'll notice, and this is not a coincidence, there is some similarities in the pawn structure and the basic concepts behind the Slav defense. So first of all, um, the, the shallow... The shallow variation, you know, get rid of this, this bishop, you know, get it outside of the pawn chain. I like that. I think it's an easy concept, and it makes a lot of sense. But, but what I was referencing those other openings, the Stonewall and the French for, is because you'll notice, black is putting all of his pawns on light squares. All of his pawns, you know, around the center and everything is on light squares. So what that means, you're going to play with your pieces on the dark squares. You know, that's where you want to influence the game, you know, with your dark... with. On, with your pieces on the dark squares. So, um, you know, you might notice here the knights, black does have a s little bit less space. You know, this pawn c4 is giving white a little space. So maybe, you know, the knights are kind of fighting over each other, maybe for the same squares, you know, in the center. So Shirov's idea, go ahead and play knight e4, it makes a lot of sense. Because if you take it, just bishop takes, and, and what's the knight doing out here? Or maybe even knight takes, and you could just take the, the knight here. You know, so this just seems favorable for Black to go ahead and be able to get his other knight to f6, where it's going to be having a lot more influence on the center. So, Anarkiev with g3 says, you know, he wants to wait. He's trying to delay the capture on g6, because this is going to open up the h-file for Black's rook. So with g3, that's, that's what he's doing. You know, he's delaying the capture, because the bishop really is not going to go anywhere, right? So why let Black try to, you know, play on the h-file right away? It makes sense for white to delay that. So now b3, and white is trying to maintain his grip on the center. The knight on d6, very well placed. So an interesting maneuver, you know, pretty instructed by, by Shirov. The knight on d6 is, is controlling a lot of critical squares in the center. So now bishop e7, essentially forcing the knight to, to capture on g6. And even though white does get the two bishops, I think the opening of the h-file and the fact that black's position has no weaknesses, everything is very well kind of compact and, and coordinated. Uh, I, I think black is doing just fine in the opening here. Queen c2, and so, you know, now Sheriff with queen c7, he castles queenside. And this is a, a cool way to play this line. I like it. You know, the, the queen is also kind of pointing in, in an x-ray, you could say, uh, an x-ray diagonal against h2. And so, 
you know, white just kind of positioning and, and maneuvering around. And this is a great way, this, this is a great way for black to achieve activity. So white goes for maybe a direct attack, trying to close the center with c5. And black's plan is very simple. Plays rook h8 anyway, ignoring the threat of g g4. Uh, because Shirov is, is just got all of his pieces. Also with g4, you'll notice that X-ray I mentioned, the queen is going to be opened up and involved in that attack a lot. So black already with a very dangerous position. And we'll go through the rest of the game pretty quickly because I've got a couple other, other games of interest to, to look at for this opening. So white opens it up. You know, black keeping it cool. And here Shirov just sacks the house. So first white kicked the queen off the diagonal. Shirov goes ahead and sacks a rook. So now he plays rook takes c3, knight d5 to hit this bishop here. And now he takes and he gets three pawns for the rook. But I guess more importantly, Black's, White's, White's king is very misplaced. And also this rook is completely out of play while Black is playing with pretty much all of his pieces. So a nice little transfer, very clean to get the queen over. And Shirov just, you know, White and Arkiev was just too, too thrown off by this game and, and the weird material balance. And he was unable to defend. A couple weird rook moves and uh, king moves as well. And in this position... Shirov just took on f1. There's no way to stop the mate on h1. So this is um, one way to play the, the, the shallow defense and, and one way that white can, can really go after you. So now we're going to go and check out something of a more recent game here. And this is actually from the 2012 Tata Steel Tournament and, and, and Vic Anzi. And this is Magnus Carlsen playing white against Boris Gelfand with black. So... You know, that other Shirov game is from 2008. Theory's changed a lot in the last few years. Now it's 2012. We'll see how, how Gelfin and, and Carlson kind of play. So again, with C6, slob defense. You've got to maintain this, the, the integrity of the, the pawns in the center on the white squares. And so Bishop F5. So you can see, I mean, Gelfin and Carlson, you know, some of the best players in the world. So this, this shallow variation, you know, it, I, I think it's okay. I, I think it's all right. You see 2,700 GMs playing it. So Carlson here opts to gain the bishop pair, and, and it's really no surprise. Carlson is uh, well known as a, a solid positional grinder type of player, so he just snatches the, the bishop pair immediately. So bishop d3, and so now bishop d6. So a little bit different because black doesn't really want to commit his queen. Maybe the queen can go here, maybe even b6. You know, there's a lot of options. So bishop d6. Just go ahead and hit that, that pawn. So instead, we saw g3 in the last game, now h3. And h3 is kind of what I've been seeing the top players playing against this line. So Gelfin decides to go ahead and take. And this is a good moment to um, you know, kind of explain the, the dynamics, the, the versatility of the Slav defense. So just, just because you know, his position is so compact, there's no weaknesses, and he really hasn't committed himself to a decisive plan. You know, it's very flexible in the opening. So here, Gelfin, you know, this, this exchange is just hanging. It's always out there, you know, in the, in the Slav defense. So he decides to take and just castle. You know, nothing crazy. And here's the deal is, is the flexibility is because black can play e5 or he can play c5. And either of those moves, very thematic breaks in the Slav, are going to give him a lot of counterplay and, and usually equalize or better for black once he gets those in. So very thematic ideas there with e5 and c5. So Carlson, sneaky guy, he plays queen c2, and if white goes e5 here, just something to keep an eye out for, queen takes g6. And this is not very cool for black. <laughs> this, is, this is not fun, you know, so just, just to keep an eye. So Gelfin, he, queen e7, you know, keeping it compact, and, and you really do want to wait to break the center with those thematic breaks, e5 and c5, until you've really completed your development, and it's clear, you know, which, which one is going to be better for you. Because, I mean, you got to get the rooks in the center. You know, you got to finish developing the minor pieces and everything. So, Gelfand, you know, giving him a little time. Rook c8, he's posturing for c5 here. And so now he kicks the bishop. And the bishop could have gone here, and then maybe c5 is, is better. Um, you know, really, really harassing that bishop. And in the game, Carlson just went back. And so now after e5, and uh, I think black with e5 is... Just completely equal. I mean, white has the bishop pair, but uh, it, it should not be so significant. You know, maybe white has a very small plus in the end game because of that bishop pair, 
But I think, you know, after 20 moves here, Gelfin just liquidating the pressure on the defile and, and trading rooks. And, you know, I, I think after Queen E7, 21 moves, Black has nothing to be worried about. I, I mean, this, I, I think this is a successful opening. Gelfin did go on to lose the game, but I think he played a little bit inaccurately in the middle game and the end game. So, you know, this is another good way to, to see Black, you know, that D takes C4, showing the flexibility, the versatility of the Slav defense, that E5, the thematic break. So moving on, I'm going to be looking at a game from 2005 and playing white is Denis Kizmatulin versus Alexi Dreev. And Dreev is definitely a specialist in, in this shallow defense, especially in the Slav. And so D4, C6, seeing the same thing, right? I mean, nothing too crazy here. And so what I'm going to be looking at here is something a little bit different where white is going to be, first he pulls out the knight h4. So, you know, you see a lot of transposition of ideas in Slav defense. You know, a lot of different move orders are possible. But, you know, I, I, it, they're all logical. It all makes sense. So now white plays queen b3. So mix it up, the knight h4, kick the bishop. You know, now he can get that. And, and now with the queen b3, he's going to be hitting this pawn here. So I don't really think it makes a lot of sense. I think queen b6, um, it, it just can lead to kind of a weakened pawn structure. That, that white maybe is going to be able to exploit, either with c5 or taking. You know, I, I think queen b6 just, it seems like it, it's better for white in most lines. So at queen c7 is a move I'd recommend. And this, you know, you'll notice, this, queen on c7 is also potentially, after these things open up, hitting the h2 pawn. And I, I just think it just makes sense. The queen on c7 is very flexible. So h3 here, which, you know, seems to be better than g3. And so knight d7. So what white, you know, white did get the two bishops, but black doesn't have any bad pieces. And that's why I like this shallop variation. You get that bishop out, the light squared bishop, you know, and this, this kind of stuff, you don't have any bad pieces. So you don't have to worry about anything, just logical development in the center, build the pressure, and then break it open. You know, either with, with taking on c4 first or playing c5 and e5 later in the game. That's just how, that's the name of the game. I mean, just maintain the, the tension, develop your pieces, build the pressure, and then just thematic break, explode the position, black is completely ready. So bishop d2, and in this game, white, you know, here knight b6, white, white played kind of a, I don't know, I think it was a little too slow, knight b6 here, and the idea is that if white plays c5, this is really bad for white. I mean, black is willing to give up two tempos, move the knight here, and come all the way back, just because the pawn c5 is it strong or weak? And I'm, I, I think it's weak. I, I think it's overextended. Uh, black tends to do very well in these types of positions where white's got this weird pawn chain to maintain. Uh, black plays moves like e5, you know, just breaking the center, and b6 even. Uh, you know, this, this is good for black. So knight b6, a good time for it. Waiting to commit his dark squared bishop. So white takes, and you're usually going to take, you know, recapture with the e pawn. Um, except in the exchange variation, sometimes you have to take with the C pawn. But typically, you're going to recapture with the E pawn. And what this, this naturally results in a, a dynamically imbalanced position with respect to the pawn structure. Because now, you know, you can see, I mean, both sides don't really have any weaknesses, nothing so clear. But the strategy for white, he's probably going to want to play E4 or maybe on the king side, and you know that's where his pawn majority is. And black, on the other hand, has a pawn majority on the queen side, so you want to use that. You don't want to forget about that in this slav and, and play moves like a5, maybe even b5 later. You know, so you usually see a5 first. So now, you know, bishop e7, white is, might as well just finish development. And now white didn't really have any other ways to improve his position, so he castles queen side. And so what black is doing, he doesn't castle yet, he plays a5. And what this does to white is it, it's confusing because black is already starting an attack and, and it's already going pretty fast. Um, black is well set up for it. And meanwhile, white, it, he can't really clearly attack black's king because black can go either side. Very flexible and the, and the center is not open, so black doesn't really have much to worry about. So king b1 and now knight c4. So just trying to, you know, willing to sack a pawn to get this light square bishop and also, it's a natural move to move the attack forward. So takes, and yeah, he takes on a4. 
Sacks a pawn, but opens the uh, A-file. So now black castles. He needs to get this other rook into the attack pretty quick here. Queen takes C4. Just doesn't work. Um, and so here, I, I mean, you know, I, I, just looking at the opening here, rook a7, and so rook a8, to me, the pressure on the a file, black has done just great in the open. You know, th this is just fine. The game continued something like a3, b6, black traded, and he tried to sack a bishop to just bust open white's king. Looks like it would have worked. I, I think bishop c3 is what white played. And from here, black just steamrolled on the queen side with the, with the connected rooks. White just didn't have enough. He didn't have enough. So moving on here, this is going to be the last game I'm going to cover in this video. And we've got Vlastimil Babala versus Alexei Dreve again playing black. And this is all the way from 1994. So Dreve has got a lot of games in this, in this shallow variation of the slot. So just kicking things off, same move order. You want to make sure you don't mess this move order up because if you play knight f6 here, white can take this. Not only are you not going to be able to play the Slav and be in unfamiliar territory, this is just seems, this is almost like a weird alakine or something. I, I mean, it's just a, like a messed up Grunfeld almost. But this is good for white. I mean, you can see he's got the big center everything. So you got to pay attention to the opening. And if c4 is played, you need, to, you need to have a pawn ready to recapture with. Just a general rule to follow. So here, you know, this, this game is just another way that white, you know, looking at another thing white can throw at you in, in this shallow variation with bishop f5. And so it's kind of like a somewhat delayed exchange variation. And so, but, but with queen to b3 here. And so black, again, you know, kind of similar to what we saw in the last game, queen c7 is the idea to, to, hold, to hold that pawn. You know, if you go queen to b6, maybe he just takes, takes, and now it seems like white, the weakness of the b5 square especially, and these, these pawns are kind of weak, seems like white has a very pleasant endgame. So queen c7, better, more active. And so this is just another way that, that white can, you know, throw stuff at you in another plan for black. So black here, very important, plays knight d7. And why this is important is because White has played, you know, bishop d2, knight c3. He hasn't built the, the light square bishop on the, on the king side because White is really aiming to take advantage of the fact that Black played queen c7 and the fact that the c file is open. So for Black here, you got to be a little careful because if you play a move, you know, you, you don't want to play normal, routine, mechanical development. Uh, you got to pay attention. I mean, this maybe is going to lead you to some trouble after a move like knight e5, if you take, um, maybe even knight takes d5. It, you know, something crazy, these complications, white's got all the choices. So instead, knight to d7, just go ahead and prevent that. The knight is going to come to d7 in these lines anyway. I mean, it seems like all the action is going on the queen side. And so bishop b5, you know, just, just getting the king out of there. And now the other rook is ready to, to come over and help the defense of this pressure on the c file. So a6, go ahead and kick the bishop. White decides to take. And so now rook b8. And from a purely, you know, talking about the opening here, after bishop b4, black is kicking those pieces back. Doesn't want to trade the dark square bishop. That'd be a mistake. You know, what bishop is better, right? The bishop on d6 now or the bishop on d2? Also, another thing to note, positional idea, black rarely wants to trade the dark square bishop because, again, the, the bishop is working with the pawns. You know, in the Slav defense, all the pawns on light squares, the bishop is working with those pawns, as well as the other minor pieces, to prevent, prevent and just pr protect those, those dark squares in the center. So a critical positional concept. So, you know, e5, just a very thematic break. And, you know, you can see black has just got a great position. It's like all of his pieces... Very well coordinated, doesn't really have any weaknesses, and I, I think after 20 C5, you know, we, we can comfortably say black has done well out of the opening here. So that's going to do it for part one of the uh, my new Slav Defense Chess Openings for Beginners series. And pay attention, you know, and keep an eye out for parts two and three that are going to cover the exchange variation and other critical lines. So this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and thanks for tuning in.